Has anyone from Gibson made any attempt to make things right on your V with the lousy paint job? Nope. How the hell is it going? It is Friday. It is time for SMG viewers comments. And just for a little more detail on that first question, yes, Gibson never reached out to me in any kind of official capacity. I did have uh, one of the guys who works in the shop just kind of message me privately. He's like, dude, how the fuck did you get that guitar? Uh, could you tell me who signed off on it? I'm like, no, I'm not going to throw the dude under the bus, you know, journalistic integrity and all that kind of shit. Believe me, I could have taken that signed card and put it on the video for everybody to see, but I don't want the guy losing his job. I just want him to do it better. Anyway, this is SMG Viewers Comments, the show that's about you, not about me. So let's get to your comments and questions right now. We're also gonna have something coming up in a couple minutes about extinction level event. I think the hate for shitting on Gibson is an artifact of fear. Gibson are worth money. They are something like an investment. Like it or not, they hold value to some degree. When you shit on Gibson, people are viewing it as an attack that could devalue their investment. This is especially salient when it's an influencer like Glenn. Sorry, Glenn, you're an influencer. I could be wrong, of course. What the hell do I know? You might have a very good point there, TT. Yeah, this is the thing. I've never quite understood the vintage guitar market at all. You know, you see these old Stratocasters. Oh, Eric Clapton vomited on this one, so it's worth $300,000. I'm like, really? I know K.K. Downing sold a bunch of his vintage guitars uh, to pay for his golf course. You know, he had an old 57 Flying V that wound up on an awful lot of classic records. And, you know, I know he sold those for, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars and shit like that. And I'm just like, I don't fucking get it because it's still a piece of wood with some, some pickups and some strings on it. That's it. The reason why these things have value is because of perception, because the greater community at large perceives the, these to be more important than the regular models for whatever reason. And again, it makes absolutely no sense at all. Rarity maybe being one of the things, I'm sure there's not a lot of 1957 Gibson Flying Vs kicking around these days. So yeah, I, I understand that and believe me, I when I put that Mustaine V up for sale because I just didn't want to go through the whole hassle, returning it, border bullshit and all the rest that goes along with it and i found a local buyer and yeah it went really fucking quick so that that is absolutely true that gibsons are worth money especially on the resale market and believe me even with the crappy ass paint job it went fast and i'm still scratching my head i'm like fucking really are you serious but it is what it is that is the situation so just remember if you are an investor who's hoping to flip guitars for profit gibson's probably your brand if you're a guitar player who wants a great instrument and doesn't want to break the bank i'd say look elsewhere Actually, something I was curious about is how do you mix speakers in a cabinet? Like, do you look for complementary frequencies, similar responses, or is it just trial and error? Appreciate the great content. Keep up the great work. Tim. Hey, Tim. Yeah, unfortunately for me anyway, it's just a whole bunch of trial and error. That's how I learned how to mic guitar was trial and error. I made an awful lot of errors first before I found something that worked. And yeah, when we're doing speakers, that's really what it comes down to is how well does one speaker sound in one particular cabinet and what happens if I try blending it with other things? I mean, that's how we found that crappy ass Behringer cabinet that I picked up for a whole whopping hundred bucks Canadian. We dropped in some Celestia Neo Creambacks and they sounded incredible. I took those same speakers out and thought, oh, I'll put them in a more expensive cabinet that was you know, a square design and they didn't sound anywhere nearly as good. So sometimes it comes down to the cabinet design. Sometimes it comes down to the speaker or a combination thereof. That's what makes it interesting. That's what makes it fun is trial and error. The great thing is speakers aren't super expensive. You can get them for 100, 150 bucks and you can really change up your tone, especially if you're recording. This can open up a massive palette of sonic possibilities. All you gotta do is be willing to put in the work. Glenn, your demo is the first that makes this amp sound great. Literally every other demo of this and the rest of the little mini high gain heads sound pretty bad to me. They sound fizzy and cheap, but you've chosen an excellent speaker cabinet to combat the harsh high end. Love that tone. Well, I figured I'd try going with what worked and that was an EVH speaker along with a Celestian hemp back. Uh, the EVH has got a nice top end on it and the hemp back's a much darker speaker. So blending those together, uh, we got a pretty good, we got a pretty good end result. Um, I was quite happy with that sound. And yeah, it's a little bit different. It's definitely different than the standard Vintage 30. And I'm guessing that's what a lot of those guys 
did, and I'm going to guess that a lot of demos that he didn't like the sound of wound up using the Vintage 30 because guitar players are incapable of thinking outside of that Vintage 30 box in a lot of ways. A lot of guys are terrified of trying anything else, and they plug it in and go, oh, it sounds thin and fizzy. No, your speaker th sounds thin and fizzy. You didn't find the right speaker to match with this particular amp. That's all it is. Once again, it all comes down to the sound is in the speaker not the fucking head. The head is going to be somewhat of it, but the bulk of the tone is coming from the speaker and you've got to be willing to fucking try new things to find what works. In this case, yeah, I got pretty pretty lucky with it. I was pretty happy with the sound I got. Um, and again, I, I'd urge everybody out there, you know, try getting a couple different speakers other than vintage 30s and finding out what works. I've had great results with the Celeste and EVHs. I've had great results with the Mototone and WGS speakers as well. And hopefully one day they're going to finally put out their Empyrean speakers. You know, fingers crossed for that. Um, I've been sitting on a couple of demos those there for a couple of years. They're great speakers, but they're just waiting for the right time to release it. Um, the Electro voice speakers that's another one i've been looking at recently the ones that are like two three hundred watts or something are insane uh apparently those are supposed to be pretty fucking cool as well and uh, somebody mentioned a couple different other brands and i found a new brand at nam and they were called tone speak and hopefully i'm gonna get to do something with those guys as well shit that reminds me i better email them after this episode so i don't forget hey siri set a reminder for an hour what do you want to be reminded about reach out to tone speak speakers all right, that's gonna happen. Glad you show a lot of love to big amps. How about tiny amps? Orange three watt, Crush, Marshall two watt, MS two, etc. And similar got used by Sylvia Massey to blend the intones with proper amps and help make the sound of blends like Tool. Do a video where you run some DI signals through the younger folk can learn this interesting technique. That's a fantastic idea. You know, I've really been getting into that whole blender thing, like using a couple of you know really nice amps over here and then like running a grindstein through them as well on like tracks three and four for a little bit of crap and then you blend everything together and it just sounds fucking massive i don't think there's any reason we couldn't do one of the little oranges actually i got a buddy of mine who's got one i should get him to bring it in here and i'm going to do exactly that uh the joyo zombie uh was a great sounding mini head as well i think would be great as blended with uh, one of the big guys over here too so yes that's a fabulous idea look for that coming in the very near future Hey Siri, set a reminder in two hours. What do you want to be reminded about? Make a video about blending big amps with little amps. Okay, add it to today's reminders. Okay, it's in the pipe. Always funny to me when folks call you up for being an anti-elitist or some shit like that. I can see the equipment in the background. You clearly don't mind spending money when it's fucking worth it. When it's not, save your money. There's so much equipment to buy. Why waste money on overpriced shit? Exactly! You know, I love expensive gear. I've got tons of it. I mean, fuck sakes. You know, got the Neve 1073 OPX back there. I got a red 16 line. I got a whole whack of compressors and stuff like that. You're not even seeing what's over here. I got some Tegler stuff, Gain Lab audio, you name it. Um, yeah, I got some beautiful, beautiful gear in here and I love using it. But it's not the be all end all. Actually, I need to do a video on my favorite two channel analog compressor that I picked up for a whopping 250 bucks. It's fucking fantastic. For those of you guys who are looking to get into this sort of thing, it'd be a great little investment to get. Absolutely. Uh, it all comes down to does it do the thing? That's all it really fucking matters. It doesn't matter if it's expensive, doesn't matter if it's cheap. Does it do the thing it's intended to do? If it's yes, then I can recommend it. All right, guys, I have been dying to tell you about this one forever, and it is now finally available. Extinction Level Event. It's Spectre Digital's first ever drum library, and we have gone to insane lengths to finally bring some realism into the world of electronic drums. Now, usually program drums stand out worse than a fart in a car, but for so many of you guys out there, it's the only option due to the noise and the expense of recording real drums. So instead of complaining about it, we spent the last two years trying to make something better. With ELE, you've got virtual mics bleeding into one another, just like on a real kit. And this is key because once you eliminate that bleed completely, it no longer sounds like a drum in a room, but it sounds like a robot. We've got numerous subtle articulations on the kit elements, so it sounds like a drummer actually playing. And what's more is we've got presets ready to go out of the box by myself, by Jackson Ward and Jordan Beal. Just load it up and you've got a massive studio sound ready to go with no extra mixing required. 
But if raw sounds are your thing, it's also got a multi-track output so you can process it just like you'd mix a real kit. If you're tired of your drums sounding like a robot, go check out Extinction Level Event right now because it's on sale for an introductory price of only 84 bucks, but just for a very limited time. Links are in the description below. Now back to the show. Chinese slave labor once again while claiming U.S. companies don't pay a living wage. At least the Chinese children get a living wage when you consider they only need the bare minimum of food to survive. Edit. Who wants to bet Glenn won't say anything bad about Chinese working conditions because Harley Benton pays him to promote their guitars? God forbid you lose a sponsor. Oh, the stupid, it burns! Dude, if you go back in my archive, I did a video in 2019 where I lost a Chinese sponsor. Uh, the company was called Mellow Audio. They gave me a piece of gear and it did not do the thing. It, it was missing one of the critical elements it said it would do and it didn't fucking work. So I made that video. I'm saying, look, this is okay, but this is a problem here. This is in manufacturing error. I don't know if it's on everything, but I can't give this my you know seal of approval because it doesn't do the thing. I lost that sponsor because I wasn't going to sit here and tell you guys otherwise. Oh, go buy this. It's awesome. When it's not, that's just not my fucking wheelhouse. Look, I've heard a mixed bag about Harley Benton, so I'm actually going to order a couple of guitars in here, but I'm getting a friend of mine to do it because I don't want to take chances on quality. I want to get the real story about what's going on with Harley Benton, not just, you know, their A models or whatever. I want to get the consumer experience, so that is going to be coming up. You could call Chinese slave labor that kind of thing. Oh, at least the Chinese can afford food. Yes, but American workers, a lot of them can't because the cost of living has gone through the fucking roof and the last couple of years. Are you aware of basic economic principles, supply, demand, and inflation? No? Have you ever opened a book before in your life and maybe studied a little of this? Try that, you dumb shit! Labor in the United States and Canada is in a very precarious position right now because large corporations have gone and bought up all the available housing, driving up the value and therefore making housing unaffordable. And that drives up the prices of everything else. Gas has gone up as well. So if you're going to drive yourself to work and you're only making $17 an hour, you've got a ch choice between you know being able to drive to work, paying your rent or eating. That's not really a good life now, is it? Very good video concept of the video itself, but whoa, the egregiousness, cursing, and insults has become quite extreme. I mean, I love that type of humor, but to overdo it, turns it a tad unfunny. Well, I'm very fucking sorry I use some fucking profanity every now and then. I don't know, maybe get over yourself. Spot on regarding quality, the UK motorcycle market was decimated by the higher quality Japanese bikes in the 60s and 70s. The Gibson simps need to realize that made in the USA means nothing when they're using CNC machines to cut the guitars in. Man, there is some fucking truth there. Here's the thing, you've always heard the phrase, those who don't pay attention to history are doomed to repeat it. And I think that's happening in the guitar market. I mean, like we saw that happen in the auto industry in the 60s and 70s. He's absolutely right. We're localized apparently it was the bike market in the UK, but I mean like the North American auto industry got its ass kicked by the Japanese in the 70s, especially because they made cars that were much more fuel efficient. Or were they higher quality cars? Yes, yes they were. Because in the 70s, especially North American auto workers got complacent and lazy. So yeah, to see the same thing happening in the guitar market is kind of sad. Now that's not saying every American manufacturer is making crap guitars. Far from it. I just did a review on the Fender American Ultra and it was fucking magnificent. It was really great. And you know, even that Gibson I reviewed, you know, played fucking amazing, but the, the fit and finish weren't that great. So hopefully they can step it up a little bit. Competition is fierce these days. And yeah, a lot of guitars are coming off CNC lines. And so there's no real difference where it comes from. It all comes down to does it do the thing? And, and if you're paying a premium for a guitar, does it meet the price point of a premium instrument? I know I'm going on and on and on about this over the last few weeks, but it's like I had so many great comments come in. I feel I need to address some of this because it's funny as hell. So here's the deal, Gibson in Memphis is only paying 15 to 17 an hour for tech building expensive guitars. I really think if they paid more to employees, then the instruments would be better. And if anyone could validate the claim that Gibson fired everyone that was working there for decades and hired inexperienced people, let me know. 
Okay, I'm going to stop you right there because that screams disinformation. I've been talking to a couple guys at Gibson that's not $17 an hour. It's more like $20 an hour. That's a lot better. That's kind of more what you'd expect. But if, then again, if you're charging $3,000 for an instrument, maybe those guys should be making you know $25 to $30 an hour so they would actually really give a shit. That, I've heard this thing over and over again. Oh, nobody wants to work. Nobody wants to work. No, nobody wants to work for the shit wages you're paying. Did you try paying people what they're worth, especially in today's job market? and real estate market? Did you pay them a living wage? If the answer is no, you've got your answer as to why you can't find anybody to work for you. And if paying people a decent wage is going to put you out of business, then you've got a failed business model. That's how that works. Now about your point on them firing everybody who knew what they were doing to replace with inexperienced people. I'm gonna call you out right there and say, I think that's a whole load of bullshit because I've read nothing to validate that claim. Um, if somebody has some, some evidence or whatnot, that's a bit different story, but that's kind of getting into the Fox News territory of absolute fucking bullshit. And I don't want the show to be about that. Bottom line though, if you're gonna make a claim like that, you'd better be able to back it up and not just go, well, hey, I think, no, no, I think isn't good enough. You'd better know before you make that kind of accusation. Glenn! Since you're known for busting metal bro science myths, I wonder if you're interested in tackling one of the always sounded bullshit to me like it's conventional wisdom. The whole single pickup guitars sound better because there's less magnetic pull and therefore more harmonic purity. Sounds fake to me, but you're the expert. Maybe have the guitars with identical bridge pickups, one with only that pickup, one with two pickups and see if they sound different and or have different EQ profile. Inquiring minds want to know. Good stuff as always, man. Thanks and fuck you. Ah, dude, I really don't know about that one, man. Um, it definitely smells like bullshit, but I mean, like, how do we measure that? That's the big question. I've got one pickup versus two pickups. Harmonic, what? <laughs> Who the fuck even comes up with this shit? Now, I know active pickups were invented to increase sustain. They had less magnetic pull on the strings and then were amplified there after they had a little preamp in, in the guitar cavity. And those are cool. Yeah, those can sound really great. EMGs worked great for thrash metal in the 80s. Absolutely. But as to say harmonic purity, yeah, that kind of smells like bullshit to me, my friend. Guitar players repeating bullshit? No, that never happens. Don't insult the audience. Yes, and be careful what audience and how to treat them. I once played in a three-quarter cover rock band. We played some Judas Priest, ACDC, some pop covers, and made in this direction. In other words, biker party compatible music. And we played through all biker clubs in our area. And one good gig leads to another. And biker club and biker clubs are very correct and not stingy. Once we played one of the biggest party of the biker club, not Hell's Angel or Banditos, a local big club that's still independent in our area. And played as first or second band late afternoon. Of course, most people are sitting and drinking beer and not doing much party. But our singer wanted to animate them and said, what are you for f lame fucking biker? Guess what happened? I heard this evening about 20 times from guests and the president, cool music, but your singer sucks. Cool show, but kick the singer out. He's an asshole. And we never played in this club or any chapters again. Band split anyway, but this was the coffin day. Here's the thing, man. Yeah, when you go up on stage, you need to be professional. You need to be aware of your audience. Yes, generally a good rule of thumb is if you're playing for a party for bikers, do not insult that audience. Your singer's lucky he didn't get the living shit beat out of him. Seriously, that's not cool. That whole culture is based on respect. You know, I saw something similar back in the 80s where, you know, the, the audience wasn't quite getting as active, but and the singer just said something like, okay, you guys are sitting over there getting fucked up. I can respect that. That's the appropriate approach, not, oh, you guys are fucking lame. Oh, fuck. What a dumbass. Anyway, hopefully you did kick the guy out as soon as fucking possible for that one. No one really gives a damn how good your riffs and gear are if your show is boring. Consider the audience. Absolutely, man. I, we're going to explore this concept in an upcoming video. It's going to be an awful lot of fun. But yeah, I think guitar players get caught up way too much on gear and riffing and all the rest of that crap and forgot the one core thing about putting on a rock show is be entertaining. Do that first. 90% of the time I'd agree with you, but I have done some shootouts of converters and I hear a big difference in 3D and depth between converters. What units do you measure 3D and depth in? That's the right fucking answer. Uh, that's Pipeline Audio. Uh, he's guesting on my recording roundtable. We got a couple more episodes of that coming up over the next couple of months. That's uh, myself. That's Ethan Weiner from Real Traps. He was the creator of that. And then we've got Pipeline Audio, who's an engineer out in Hawaii. And uh, it's, a, it's all about evidence-based arguments in the audio world and cutting through the bullshit. It's a really cool series. Um, next up, we're going to be looking at manufacturing in the States versus manufacturing in China and all the considerations going to that. It's going to be a hell of an episode. And then I think we're going to take a look at some preamps and some other shit. But yeah, we touched on the whole converter thing there a couple months back. And when you actually fucking measure expensive converters, 
versus you know the bargain basement ones, you're talking like a 0.0001% difference in noise. Oh, I can hear the difference. Sure you can. Yeah, thank you for the AT2020 shout out. I've been preaching the gospel on that mic forever and I always get hate for it, but it's a solid cheap mic. For the price, it's kind of astonishing how good it is. Glad I'm reading this comment. I need to order one and do a Fearless Gear review. I've, uh, the, uh, Ethan was going on and on about the AT2020. It's about a hundred bucks and apparently it's great. I did a shootout on a bunch of hundred dollar mics there last year and they were all pretty shit except for the Sony. Apparently the AT2020 punches way above its price point. So I definitely want to do that. Another mic to consider is the Lewitt 240 Pro. It's about 150 bucks and is definitely one of my go-to mics. It sounds great on fucking everything. And it punches again way, way, way above its price point. It's a great time to be an engineer. AT2020, really? That round table just saved us a lot of money. Just saw uh, compare, and I must say, I can't justify the price of the heavy lifters. Well, yeah, that's the idea, you know. Unfortunately, not too many people watch that episode, which kind of sucks. Seriously, guys, you want to get some facts, you want to learn some shit, come to those round table episodes. I think we're going to rebrand the series to Don't Get Mad, Get Evidence, or something along those lines, because, uh, you know, I, more people need to see this series, because there's just so much facts and so much cool stuff going on, talking with real experienced audio engineers instead of guys you know talking out of their ass and go oh it has 3d and depth and vintage this and warmth that it's like oh fuck's sakes it, that kind of stuff just makes my stomach turn does it do the thing that's the question that really needs to be answered and can you measure how more superior something is compared to something else that's what it really comes down to you know don't don't fall for the bullshit guys come hang out it's gonna be fun if you're going to be a fucking rock star, go be one. People don't want to see the guy next door on stage. They want to see a being from another planet. You want to see somebody you'd never meet in ordinary life. Let me kill my star. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he yelled it. And if you don't have one of those guys fronting your band, that's why nobody's coming to your show. All right, everybody, that's it for this episode. Thanks so much for watching. Once again, Grow Grab Extinction level event for all you guys who are playing electronic drums at home or doing desktop produced music, that kind of thing, and just can't record a drum set. It is going to be one of the most realistic program drum libraries you will ever ever get to play with it's on sale right now links in the description below go check it out all right until next week hasadigi boy my friends